Robert's got a great book out called The Ten Rules of Rock and Roll, which is, um, which is excellent for, for lots of reasons. It covers lots of, lots of ground. I also, I, there were two bands in there which I loved listening to when I was younger and I kind of forgotten about, and that was Creedence Clearwater Revival and mm. Buddy Holly. Who are they? Both, and I'd sort of forgotten about them and how much I liked them. Are they, are they is that music that you listened to when you were younger as, as well, or is that still...? Yes, it is. Um, Buddy Holly was introduced... Uh, to me uh, via John McLean uh, who made an album uh, in 1971-70 uh, called American Pie and uh, um, it was uh, one of the first albums I bought and he sort of um, very much it, it was a very influential album and he, he had this thing about Buddy Holly it was an interesting combination of people he was going for in this album it was Vincent van Gogh Buddy Holly, and I think there was a big poem inside on, um, I think it was Wild Bill Hickok, and sort of, you know, a Dutch painter, 50s rock and roller, and a Wild West guy, you know, and I was like 12. It, it seemed like an interesting combination of people for a singer-songwriter to sort of, you know, normally singer-songwriters just put out albums, you know, their songs, but Don McLean had this thing where he was trying to push people and uh, so I got into Buddy Holly through him, through that song American Pie, and I just went out and got Buddy Holly's greatest hits and loved it. That's that's a con- yeah. Those, those connection with those three people is is un- unusual, and also the connection that you make in the book between Buddy Holly and the Velvet Underground and the Modern Lovers, which is something I've never really kind of thought about. But well, it it's, it's his guitar playing. Um, um, Buddy Holly, uh, he's uh, it, it's just a. Uh, it's, in a way, it's quite a, you know, like a white way of playing rock and roll. You know, it's not like Chuck Berry. Um, um, it's it's a lot more or Bo Diddley. It's a lot cleaner. Um, it's a lot more strummy, and and he sort of has that. So it's not as bluesy, and it's just uh, he's playing a Stratocaster. He's one of the first people to play a Stratocaster. You know, that someone like later like you know Jimi Hendrix yeah. will popularize. So he's playing that. Um, Buddy Hoy's playing that in 1957, 58. So he's, he's got a great guitar. And he's playing this sort of strum thing between um, chords and lead guitar that's quite simple and also um, revolutionary in a way that it's quite melodic. And so he was... And it sounded quite simple. It sort of sounded like something that, although I didn't have a guitar, that you know, like maybe I could do. You know? It sounds like punk rock. Yeah, yeah like, it, and, and then, it, you know, like the Beatles pick it up, you know, like he was a hero to the Beatles. And, uh, you know, I hear someone like, you know, Sterling Morrison in, in, in Buddy Holly, you know, someone like, you know, you're talking about Creedence, someone like, like Tom Fogarty, you know, the, the rhythm guitar player for Creedence. Uh, I, I hear something, you know, that there's a strain there. You know, Creedence to Buddy Holly is very close. The... Um the section of the book that the Buddy Holly part is in is a section called The Ten Bands I Wish I'd Been In. Yeah. And that's, I, I really love that. I really love that section. It's, oh, thank it's, you. It's great. Um, and the other one I particularly love is the David Bowie, nine, David Bowie's Band yeah. in 1971. Yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah. And it, I just, it's such a, it's, it just struck me as such a great way to, to write about music is to fantasise about being in the band because that's sort of how you often listen to music. You know, yeah. It's... it's, it's the, the listener has this kind of builds up this fantasy world that is is based around the music. And yeah, I mean, so, someone like um, like Bowie is is very strong. Uh, uh, to me, it's all, uh, like great artists always present a world. You know, it's like they're talking about that Don McLean record, and and it, it's it's you immediately like pictures and fantasies and and scenarios immediately come to mind. Through like the album cover, uh, you know, we're talking about that time when album covers were that size. But you know, um, photos or interviews you read about them, um, I always grab for because it just sort of built whatever artists I liked. You just built them up bigger and made them more, you know, vivid in my imagination. Mm. Yeah, well, that's something in the in the reviews in the in the in the book that I, I really like. Is it often. It's not just the songs; it's the it's the yeah it's the it's the album artwork that you talk about, and it's the the band's career to date, and it's it's the way um, the production works, and all those sorts of things, and and it's it's very much reviewing an album, and it made me made me sort of rethink how much I like albums and what a good art form an album is, and it's 
I suppose it seems obvious, but it's in recent years I've tended to look more, you know, on the internet, listen to a few songs on MySpace of bands, and then kind of leave it at that. But let me rethink about about how good albums are. And I think bands put a lot of thought into it. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so if bands are putting a lot of thought into, I don't think bands just um, give all their effort into the music. I think the presentation, and this is through my own personal experience, you know, I know through Go Between's records how much we talked about the covers, how much we talked about, you know, do we, do we list the producer first or the engineer first? Or, or, you know, like, am I down on this? If you look at Go Between's albums through the 80s, you know, one album, I'm, you know, it's Robert Forster vocals and electric guitar, and then the next album it's Robert Forster sonic rhythm guitar, you know, it's all this ridiculous stuff that I'm going through in my head because I'm perceiving the way that I can be perceived outside the band and so um, it's, it's, I just know from personal experience how much thought goes into these things and besides you know the big things like who's going to produce the album you know are we going to do it are we going to you know um, is the engineer going to do it that we like or are we going to get a producer from America or are we going to fly someone here all of these sort of things go into it and um, you can just sort of pick up the CD or get it online and think well that's the only thing the band's telling me but really there's a whole world around there that the band themselves are just nuts about that they're also putting with their music. And so when I, it just comes naturally to me when I have to review a record, I start to look at all this sort of stuff beside the music. I start to look at all this sort of stuff around it. And the bands normally are dropping big hints. You know, there's big things coming off sleeve notes. You know, you, you might get an album and there might be three producers you know, and you go, well, why? You know, why, why? And they've obviously, they're either trying to go for three different sounds or there's trouble. You know, they're, they're, they're dissatisfied with that person, so they've gone on to that one, and then they've gone to that one, and then you'll find, you know, like they've remixed it somewhere else or, you know, and it's just, you just sort of try and untangle it all and try and, and but it's there in the information on the record sleep. I, I totally agree. I feel sometimes in playing music, we can write a song really quickly and then sort of arrange it and it sort of feels like it's done in an afternoon and then spend months working out the cover and working mm. out what you're going to write inside it. Sort of, mm. What about lyrics on, on CD sleeves and record sleeves? I, I think that sometimes go-betweens had them and sometimes they didn't. Yeah, it's something I go back and forth with. Um, almost album to album. I, I, like, I like the idea of hearing an album and not being able to cheat by looking at the lyrics before. And, and then I think, uh, no, it's good to have the lyrics. And um, an another point about, about lyrics also is that albums, um, which I found out through my wife who's German, is that um, people in Europe, uh, mainland Europe, um, um, people read the lyrics, you know, because English, English is not the first language, so what they're hearing off the record, it's helpful. Um, and uh, so, but I go back and forth between the obvious, you know, giving the, you know, like the lyrics read, listening to, and then the whole mystery, uh, no, don't do the lyrics, and let them just come on to you. It's, it's, I change album to album. Yeah, it's, on the way here I bought a record, but... Eddie Current Suppression Ring, and when I was waiting, I got here early and I was waiting, and I read all the lyrics to all the songs before I even listened to the record. And it's a really, it's a, it's a weird, it's like now I've, I sort of, I don't, I don't know if they work so well, you know, Love right. and <laughs> Which album, which one is it? The new one. All right, think, yeah. You a fan? Yeah, I love them. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Um, I, um, I like them. I, um, I haven't got an album yet. I've, I've heard bits of them. Someone burnt one for me, and, and I've been meaning to get the new one. I could read out the lyrics. You know. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> well, you know, like, um, they've, they've got a... There's also someone in their, their band that, that does production work, too. Yeah, I think the guitarist is... Mm, he's got an eight-track down in um, Melbourne, which sounds interesting. Yeah, it's, it's that... Yeah, it's that sound. Yeah. But, you know, I know, I can imagine reading the lyrics is strange for you. Yeah. Um... Don McLean didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Dylan, Dylan, Dylan didn't really do it either, I think. Um, he kind of did these like, weird prose poems where he kind of um, put all the, other, all the words into it. Or, you know, some words from songs yeah. into it. Yeah, no, I don't think... Um, I can't think of a Dylan album with the words printed, actually. 
Yeah. Um, just going to a completely different thing. Mm. Um, the go betweens have a bridge named after them yeah. in Brisbane. Yeah. Which, um, and I was reading the other day that when the bridge was open, the mayor um, said that the go betweens lived and breathed Brisbane. And yeah. it's, it's right there to have a bridge. And it is right there to have a bridge named after yeah. them. I was wondering if you had thought why you lived and breathed Brisbane, or whether you think you do even live and breathe. Boy, Brisbane. that's a good question. Um, born there, I was born there um, and did all my schooling there. And uh, so I think if you, you're born somewhere and you do all that schooling, you're schooling there, I think if you lived there till the age of 21 before I left, I think, you, you know, you, it's in you. Mm. It's, it's, you, you. You have that authority you know, in a strange way. Um, so I feel, you know, I mean, these are big compliments and these are big uh, things that have been handed to the band recently. Um, but I feel in terms of, uh, what you know that point that you're making, that particular point. Um, you know, I feel like a, a, a Brisbane artist, um, and <clears throat> it's also um, something that um, myself and uh, and Grant McLennan, you know, like the songwriters, it's something that we didn't shy away from um, early on, and it wasn't really being done. Mm. Um, it wasn't uh, something that was um, on every songwriter or you know, people that were writing books or whatever, it wasn't on people's agenda so much in the late 70s and the 80s when we were um, first starting writing songs. Um, do, you th do you think any bands live and breathe Sydney? Sherbet did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, who else? Um... um the Flying Circus? I don't... Even though um, well, they did. Um, who else? Um, you know, like going on, I think you and I did. Mm, um, I agree. And uh, um, there's, there's three. Yeah. Like, <laughs> they should play a gig together, I think, all three. Yeah. Be a good bill. Yeah. <laughs> living and Breathing Sydney. Um, speaking of Living and Breathing Sydney, yeah. I was hoping you'd play the song Darling Hurst Nights, okay. which is, I think is a great Sydney song. <coughs> This is a song uh, I wrote uh, about uh, four or five years ago, and it's um, it's called Darlinghurst Nights, and uh, it's about Darlinghurst uh, in the um, early mid '80s. Coffee, 
and I must go back to my room. More chapters to go. We'll meet up in an alley with more places I. Every day I'm gonna write a movie And then I'm gonna star in a play And then I'm gonna go to Caracas Cause you know I Well I've just gotta I gotta get away Yeah, Marjorie and Kim Andy and Clint Debbie, Bertie People came and people went and there was Susie Who we never ever Saw again Yeah, and always the traffic Always the lights Climbing that hill on Star-studded nights Joe played the cello Ah. Oh. There's a lot of mystery in that song, and I sort of don't want to ask, but I do, who, mm. who Susie is. Oh, I was someone I don't know who everyone is, but... I, um, Susie know. was um, a woman uh, called... I forget her last... No, it was something like... It, the drama from I Heart Hiroshima is called Susie Patton, and this woman in the mid-'80s was called Susie... I forget... She was, she was around um, a whole group of friends in Darlinghurst that were in that song. This is around 86. Weird thing was, Bob Dylan came to town on, on a tour then, 86, 87. I think this is the tour where he does a press conference with um, Brett Whiteley. And um, Dylan didn't have any clothes or didn't or need stage clothes. And she sort of did, um, um, like, did clothes, secondhand clothes. Um, you know, had a stall and, and sewed. And lived by herself, you know, in, in Darlinghurst. And she got a call, and it was, you know, like, I don't know how they got onto her, but, you know, like, Dylan needs some clothes or Dylan needs a jacket. And so she went, and, um, and then Dylan just liked her and liked the clothes, and she just, she, she ne- virtually never came back from the concert. You know, it was like, <laughs> and, you know, like, people were just walking around the next day and, dumb, you know, where's Susie? And it's like, she's gone, you know. And, and, and I, but I'd hear it, like, every now and then, um, She'd be, um, you know, like she'd still be with, with, with Bob. I don't know if she's still with Dylan on the road, but she, she's, she was gone for many, many years and it was always, oh, she's on the road with, with Bob Dylan. It it's very weird. Bob Dylan's, Bob Dylan's very strange. I know three people, I, you know, like all the superstars, I don't know anyone that works for anyone. I know three people who are, I know Dylan's manager, his artwork person, and Susie, all who work with Dylan or still do, and I knew them before they worked with Dylan, and I don't know anyone else that works with anyone else. It's really weird. Maybe I will go you, on you to, could, to, you to could, work with Dylan. You could, you yeah. could, yeah. It'd be hard to come back to Darlinghurst after that. You know, I can see why. It's like, yeah, it's I, I don't know where she is now. Yeah. She, yeah. Um, and Frank Brunetti? Frank Brunetti was um, a guy... Uh, okay, Frank Brunetti used to write for a magazine called Ram in the early 80s, in the 80s. Frank Brunetti was the original keyboard player for Died Pretty. And uh, so Frank was in Died Pretty, and like we knew all the guys, like Brett Myers, and, those, and Brett Myers from Brisbane, and, uh, and the guys from Died Pretty originally in a band in Brisbane called The End, and they came down, and they all moved into like around Darlinghurst. And Frank... Um, um, played um, the keyboards just for a couple of years. The, the, there's an inside joke in the song, um, is that when Frank played on stage with um, Died Pretty, he always um, wore 
wrap around sunglasses, you know, it's sort of homage to, you know, the Velvet Underground mm. in a way. And so, you know, like, um, gut rock, rock and roll through the eyes of Frank Bernetti for me is, you know, it's because he's always got the shades on. But anyway, um, so that's Frank Bernetti. He lives down in Melbourne. He used to work for Gaslight um, Records, right. you know, in the 90s. Uh, I'd see him occasionally down in Melbourne. He was a journalist. He was a rock journalist. Yeah. Um, and Clinton, you know. Do you Clinton. know Clinton? Clinton Walker? Yeah, Clinton Walker. No, yeah. that, That's it is, Clint, yeah. It is that Clinton. Yeah. I was wondering. Yeah. I guess, I, something I guess that probably a lot of people who, you know, write songs and stuff want to know is how other people's process works. Right. And this one really basic question I had was, do you wake up in the morning and go, right, today's a, today's a music writing, today's a monthly article day, or today's a songwriting day? Um, no, I sort of... Um, it's changed over the last five years since I've started writing for the monthly. My whole work life has changed like 100%. And I now go out virtually five days a week to the shed in the back, backyard and start with either writing for the monthly or, or I'm trying to write a book or I'm working on the book. Um, and guitar playing. But, you know, there are days when I go out and do that as well, odd days. Um, but, you know, like I wrote songs from 1977 to I started working for the monthly in 2005 so for every day uh, five days a week from 1977 virtually to 2005 I was a songwriter mm. so I'm actually happy to be doing something else first or that's taking up my time and so music in a way has become songwriting in a very bizarre way has become like a hobby which is great you know like sort of I'm in my early 50s um, I've got, a, you know, like a long career in music and suddenly it has this new place in my life. Uh, it's really good and I find that I'm, bizarrely enough, I'm writing more songs now with it not as this main sort of brain-destroying focus, but just off to the side, I do more. Mm. I write more and I like what I'm writing. Do you feel or something that I have is, it's like, I always tend to write a song I like when I'm supposed to be doing something else. You know, it's like, I really should not be playing guitar at the moment, but... Right. Yeah. Um, no, I... You know, like, I, I often write... Um, it's in, in, a, in a way, this is like what I just said, is that I'll, I'll, um, I'll try and write a song for you know, a couple of hours in the morning, and then in the evening, when dinner's coming, I'll pick up my son's crappy guitar and play something that's miles better yeah. Yeah. Uh, in two minutes before dinner than the three hours that I spent out in the shed, you know, when it's like, op, you know, like the optimal time to be writing, I'll grab something quickly on a, on a you know, like a beat up guitar and it'll be, you know, better. Some of your songs to me sound like, I don't know what I call idea songs. It sounds like you have an idea about something mm. and then you're like, I might, I might run a, write a song about yeah. that. Is that yeah. true? I don't have the idea beforehand. Or some of them, sometimes I do. Um, like Darling Hurst Nights, I had the title for a while. I thought that was a really good title mm. for a song. Um, but I'm not a natural musician. You know, I'm not... I always... I'm quite um, intuitive and, and primitive. Mm. You know, I, I, I wasn't learning the piano when I was eight. You know, I didn't pick up the guitar when I was 12. I don't think inherently I'm a musical person, you know, um, which I think gives my work a certain limit, um, but also a certain power. It, it's I'm I'm quite uh, I'm not I, I I hear music by people who have not have you know have gone to you know the conservatorium but I hear people you know like that obviously playing piano music and 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 uh, the music's quite natural you know people like Paul Weller or the whole lot of people like that it's it's in their bones and their fingers and um, I'm not one of those people I, I'm sort of from that punk rock post punk time. And I didn't start playing guitar until I was 15 or 16. So I'm not someone that can write really good imitation bitty songs. I sort of take a big bite and it either works or it doesn't. Mm. And I end up writing just like, like two songs a year with that approach, you know, because I, I sort of, I, you know, every song feels like that I write feels like the last, you know, and then I write it and I'm euphoric for about three weeks. I've got a new song and it's like, oh, I've got to start again, you know. And it's like reinventing, and I look, and you know, yeah. 